Hello everyone, my name is Mauro Facchini, I'm coming from the European Commission and I'm the responsible for the Copernicus program. It's my pleasure today to introduce you what is the Copernicus program and what you can do with that. So let's start with uh, this presentation. So what is Copernicus in brief? Copernicus is a flagship program of the European Union. It is uh, a tool to monitor the Earth, but also to prepare for crisis and also for security monitoring. It has also a support of, to the EU as a global player, and it adopts a full, free, open uh, policy for data and information, and for sure is a tool for economic development and the creation of jobs. Co some Copernicus history. So Copernicus started already in 98 in a place in Italy called Baveno, and today in 2016, 17 now, we can say that uh, uh, Copernicus is really operational. Uh, it went through different steps uh, because there was a development phase dealing with research. We collaborated with different entities. Uh, there were delegation agreements, contracts placed. Uh, so a long history. Many things have been done. Many legislation adopted. But today we can say that really we are operational. This involved also funding and from the European side, the European Commission side, we had to finance different steps. We had to finance research, we had to find preparatory actions, we have to find initial operations and today we are financing Copernicus as a full programme. So if we see the whole budget, until 2014 there has been a budget of 1.3 billion involved and for the period from 2014 until 2020 there is an involvement of 4.3 billion euros. What is the governance? It's a quite complicated system because it involves different actors, but in the end it's working properly. On the top, the European Commission is the program manager. And then we have three strands, three columns that we can define, a space component, a services component and an in situ component. How do they work? The space component is coordinated by the European Space Agency and the operations are ensured by the European Space Agency itself with the cooperation of UMETSAT. The services are delegated to different bodies. We'll look better into detail later when we'll check about the different services. And then there is an in situ component. The in situ component, even better defined later, is coordinated by the European Environment Agency. We have already conducted analysis in order to estimate what is the Copernicus monetary benefits. So we checked what has been the amount of money that has been invested and the benefits between 2018 and 2020. And we have realized that there are for sure bigger benefits than the money that has been invested. And in this slide you can also see some examples of existing Copernicus benefits in different areas, ranging from agriculture to fisheries, uh, to energy sectors, uh, uh, industrial sectors and so on. So from the slide you can see some details about these estimations. Also some estimations of job creations are indicated in this slide. There are different areas where we can look into these benefits because it's true that we are speaking about a system that is uh, taking pictures from space about uh, our earth but all these pictures all these elements can be transformed into information and information that can be used in different areas and here you see a list that we can mention so the climate change and the environment security and defense health blue economy energy and natural disasters development and cooperation tourism insurance and disasters management, uh, urban planning, forestry. And these are just some of those where we can have really inputs, really information. Many other can be identified and we are still working in order to identify areas where new information can be generated in support of uh, these different areas. Some examples of Copernicus benefits, among those that we have mentioned before, we have seen, for example, that for a pipeline infrastructure monitoring in the Netherlands, we can have a benefit that is ranging between 15 and 18 million per year. In the forest management in Sweden, we can see also benefits for Sweden between 16 and 22 million per year. And winter navigation in the Baltic, we can see again benefits for northern countries like Sweden and uh, Finland between 24 and 106 million per year. These are just some estimations and some examples, but we can really work and show you in the future many other applications. It's just a way to show you what can, are some of the benefits possible. The Copernicus program is a user-driven program. 
meaning that it's not driven by policy makers, but by the users themselves. As you see from this slide, actually user requirements are at the basis of the definition of all the elements. So the Copernicus space and its C2 data, the Copernicus services, and also in the definition of some downstream products. There are long processes in order to collect all these user requirements and to transform them in capacities to deliver this information to the users. But after that, we have to make be sure that the users are really taking into account these capacities and they are able to use them. So there is a long also user uptake activity in order to make this possible. But now let's come to the real structure of the program. And we start with the space component. So the space component is based on two elements. Some specific satellites that are really developed and launched for Copernicus and the use of existing one. In this slide, you can see what are the families of the so-called Sentinels. The Sentinels are the satellites that have been specially developed for the program. You see there are six families of satellites plus a Sentinel 5P that is a precursor of Sentinel 5. In this slide, you can see really at once all the main information, meaning the resolution, uh, the revisit time, the type of satellite and the key features. In the next slides, we'll get more into the details of each of these satellites. So let's move to the evolution of the launches. You see here what has been the planning for the launch of these satellites is a long lasting activities running from 2014 until at least 2030. In many cases, you see that there is not just one satellite per every family, but there are more than one. So for example, for Sentinel-1, we have four satellites named Sentinel-1A, Sentinel-1B, Sentinel-1C and Sentinel-1D. The same applies for Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3, and similar approaches exist also for the other one. So this plot is really showing you from 2014 to until 2030, how the family and the constellation of Copernicus satellites is created. Sentinel-1 so is a SAR sensor, so Synthetic Aperture Radar Sensor. It has the feature to look to the Earth in all weather because it can see also through the clouds and also in darkness, so day and night. You see the resolution, the revisit time, and concerning the launches, already Two of them have been launched, so uh, in 2014 and in 2016. The other two, so Sentinel-C and Sentinel-D, have been already ordered and are foreseen for launch later in the next years. And you see in the slide what are the main services in which this family of Sentinels can uh, support. Going to Sentinel-2, Sentinel-2 is a multispectral optical sensor. Again, you see the resolution between 10 and 60 meters, five days of the revisit time, and uh, the first unit was launched in June 2015. The second unit is foreseen to be launched uh, this year, and uh, so already at that moment uh, we'll have two satellites flying, uh, and this will help to increase the revisit time of the observations. And this uh, satellite can contribute again to some of the services, and here in detail, the main services that can benefit from data generated by this uh, satellite. Sentinel-3 is a medium resolution imaging and altimetry. The difference with the previous one is in particular in the resolution. You see that in this case we have a resolution between 300 and 1200 meters with a revisit time that is, can be lower than uh, two days. It can be used to monitor both the sea and the land surface. It has four instruments on board and some of these are actually dedicated to the sea and other mostly dedicated to the land. The first unit was launched at the beginning of 2016 and the second one is expected to be launched in 2017. And again, also in this case, uh, two more units are ordered, so the C and D units. From the slide, you can see what are the main services that can benefit from the observation of this satellite. Sentinel-4 is a satellite with instrument mostly for atmospheric observation. It's not a full satellite. This is a difference from the previous one. It's just an instrument that will be on board 
of an instrument of a satellite that is launched by UMETSAT. So it will be on board of this MTG satellite from UMETSAT. So as I said, it will look into atmospheric chemistry. And it has a resolution that is in the range of 8 kilometers with 60 minute revisit time. It will be launched uh, expected in 2022. It will mostly contribute to the atmosphere monitoring and also to the climate change uh, monitoring. And uh, this uh, uh, satellite is uh, a geostationary one, meaning that it's not rotating around the Earth, but it's really looking, fixing to a specific part of the Earth. Sentinel-5P is a satellite that will be a precursor of the Sentinel-5 that I will mention later. It's uh, a satellite foreseen to observe uh, atmospheric chemistry. It has a resolution between 7 and 68 uh, kilometers with one day revisit time and it will be launched in 2017. It will have mostly an instrument provided by the Netherlands and this will be on board of uh, a platform that has been developed. So Copernicus Atmosphere Services and Copernicus Climate Change Services will be the ones that will mostly benefit from the observation of these satellites. They will be a precursor so of Sentinel-5 and Sentinel-5 again like Sentinel-4 is an instrument that will be on board of a satellite launched by UMETSAT. It will help also to look into atmospheric chemistry mission. It will complement in some way what is done by Sentinel-4 and so Sentinel-4 and 5 together will help to better understand what is the atmospheric composition of our planet. And the resolution will be between 7 and 50 kilometers, with one day revisit time expected to be launched in 2021. And as the previous ones, it's mostly for uh, atmosphere and for climate change monitoring. Sentinel-6 is a radar altimeter. Its main feature is to measure the sea surface height with high precision, with 10 days revisit time, and it will be launch expected in 2020. This is very important because it will help really to understand with high precision what is the height of the seas all around the world. And this will naturally contribute to the Copernicus Marine Environment Services, but also in some way to atmosphere and climate change aspects. As I said in the beginning, when speaking about the space component, it's not just about Sentinels, but it's also about existing satellites even before the launch of the Sentinels. So the Copernicus program is also buying data from existing capacities, in particular in some areas. And here from this light, you can see a full constellation of existing satellites from which we buy data. These satellites are provided either by commercial users or are owned by some of the member states of the European Union. So we have a mechanism in place by which we can buy data to support some of the needs of our services. We touch what we call the space component. Let's see now what is the in situ component. So space components is looking from the top. So the satellite is looking at our planet. But in situ components are some observations that are taken directly on our planet, meaning some instruments that can really check some parameters directly on the ground, on the sea, etc. Examples can be uh, some detectors of air quality or seismograph for detecting some earthquake actions and so on. There are so data, as is mentioned here in the slide, ground, sea and airborne. And they can be used to validate and calibrate the satellite data or also to give data that complement those from the satellite. By fusing the data from the satellites and the data from these in situ sensors, it's possible to provide better information. And this in situ data can be uh, approached in two ways. There can be specific in situ data for each service, and so every service is dealing directly with the in situ provider, or there can be in situ data that are, let's say, cross-cutting so that can be used by different services at the same time. And in this respect, uh, we have an entity, so the European Environment Agency, that is coordinating the provision of this cross-cutting in situ needs. So we spoke about space, in situ. Let's come now to the services. Services you see in this plot, the six services has how they are structured today. So is the land, marine, atmosphere, climate change, emergency and security. So this is the way by which we decided to structure the services of the Copernicus program. 
And in the next slide, we will get more into what the services are delivering and what can be the different benefits and also some mention on the way these services are structured. This will be very, very important because these services are not managed directly by the European uh, Union, even if we are the manager, but they are delegated to bodies who are running these services on behalf of the European Union. Here you see the implementation schedule. So as you've seen the implementation schedule for the space component before with the different launches, here you see the implementation schedule for the different services. And you see that uh, at uh, the, between the end of 2016 and the beginning of 2017, all the bullets are, have been uh, fixed. So we can say that between the end of 2016 and the beginning of 2017, everything is in place. So all the contractual details with the implementing entities for the different services have been put in place. So the program is really operational from this point of view. Now, let's read one by one. So the land monitoring service, it has been, the management of this service has been delegated to the European Environment Agency. You can see from this slide how it is structured. So because it can look to global aspect, it can look to pan-European aspect and to local aspects. Uh, so the European Environment Agency is in particular taking care of the pan-European part and of the local part. While for the global part, the GRC of the European Commission is uh, contributing in producing some of uh, the variables and the products. You can see on the right hand side uh, the kind of products that, that can be generated in the different uh, areas and then on the left hand side so you can see areas where that can benefit from the products of these services so ecosystems biodiversity agriculture forestry energy natural resources water urban planning and these are just some of them some others i think can be provided for the future and also the number of products generated by the service is slowly increasing and they're getting more and more operational The next one is uh, the marine service. Again, on the right hand side you can see the kind of uh, products generated and on the left hand side you can see the areas uh, that can benefit. Uh, the service is delegated to Mercaton Océan, a French entity that is coordinating the contracts in this domain. The products generating are linked to the sea level, ocean salinity, ocean temperature, sea ice, wind, ocean currents, ocean color, and so on. And we can have really maps and products detailing on these different elements. And the areas that can benefit from these products are listed, can be marine safety, marine resources, coastal and marine environment, climate forecasting, and all the areas like transport, tourism, and, and so on. And even here, evolution of the service is foreseen for the future. Atmosphere monitoring, this uh, service is delegated to ECMWF, this uh, international agency entity that is uh, based in Reading in the UK. And uh, the main products that are generated in the frame of this service, are, as you see, are air quality and atmospheric composition, uh, climate forcing models, uh, ozone layer and UV maps, uh, solar radiation maps, uh, and some emission uh, maps. Areas that can benefit from these products are mostly in the area of health, environment, pollution, climate, renewable energies. Climate change is also delegated to ECMWF. So ECMWF is running two out of the six program areas, services of Copernicus. What is the aim of uh, this service is really to help uh, by the Earth's observation to provide data demonstrating how the climate is changing or how the measures that are put in place can mitigate the climate change. The products uh, of this service are mostly in the, in the generation of what we call essential climate variables, so some variables that are very much linked to the climate uh, in order to support to mitigation and, adapt and adaptation strategies uh, done at global and regional level in order to provide uh, seasonal forecast and climate projections. And again, this is extremely important for climate change, mitigation adaptation, weather forecast, pollution, environment, health. So everything that is linked to climate change, so to the change of the climate of our planet. 
Emergency management is a service that is run by some services of the European Commission, mostly the GRC, but in cooperation of the DG ECO that is really in charge of emergency activities. This service is looking to the whole cycle of emergency, meaning the early warning, the reaction to an event and also what happens later, for example, in the reconstruction aspects. And this can be done by early warning, so I start from, from the front bottom, so early warning, for example, in the areas of floodings or anticipating so potential fires or droughts. Then when there is an event, when there is a disaster, rapid mapping by generating reference map, delineation maps, grading maps, what does it mean? It's simply to generate maps that can show what is the level of, for example, destruction in the case of, a, of, a, uh, of an earthquake. And these maps can really help, for example, civil protections in the way by which they have to intervene in a given area. But can also provide maps later, so to try to understand what has been the result of the action after the event, so what has been the reconstruction, for example, in the cases of these emergencies. And in order, so to summarize, this is extremely useful in disaster emergency situations, so civil protections are those that mostly benefit of this service, and also to intervene in the case of some humanitarian crisis, mostly linked to uh, disasters that can be environmental or even man-made uh, disasters. The sixth service is what we call uh, security. It's uh, declined in three different uh, sub-services that we call border surveillance, maritime surveillance and support to EU external action. First one, border surveillance, it has been delegated to Frontex, so the agency in charge of border surveillance in the European Union. And uh, the main topics to be covered by this activity is uh, the coastal monitoring, pre-frontier monitoring and some reference mapping in the area of border control. Maritime surveillance has been delegated to EMSA, so the Maritime Surveillance Agency of uh, the European Union. And the main task is to support in maritime surveillance of area of interest, vessel detections, vessel tracking, vessel anomaly detection. The third one is support to EU external action, is a service that has been delegated to the SATSEN agency, let's say, that is based in uh, close to, to Madrid. And uh, the main activity is really to support the external action jobs, uh, actions of uh, the European Union. And you see there a list of potential products that can be generated by this activity. So, for example, uh, give maps in conflict damage areas, uh, reference maps, support to evacuation plan, and so on. So we have spoken about the six services. I repeat again, it was land, marine, atmosphere, climate change, emergency and security. Beyond this categorization of the services, we can look into specific sectors that can benefit about these services. Here there is an example about the agriculture sector, so where it was possible, for example, to extrapolate some potential benefits. If we look into agriculture, mostly benefiting of the land products, we see that we can contribute so, to some aspects like precision farming, seasonal mapping, field scale and crop dynamics, irrigation management, food security, agriculture development and so on. Support of satellite data, Earth observation to atmosphere existed since a long time. But the existence of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data brought new information and this was confirmed by the expert that apparently are very happy about these new data and they found new ways to generate new products in support to agriculture needs. So, and the agriculture sector can really benefit from Earth observation and activities run in the Copernicus program. And here on the right hand side you can see also some tangible examples of benefits that can be obtained from the Earth observation capacities, so more efficient use of agricultural inputs, so with some economies in the cost, better quality of food production, more efficient and appropriate use of fertilizers. Uh, there has been also a case study, more, much more detail. This is again, is just one example, but we can generate, we have other examples, but here, in order to be sure, we have just this example. So 
improving irrigation management in Austria with Copernicus. So you can look into the details, uh, you can also find the data in websites. But the main result is that through Copernicus apparently it's possible to have 23% reduction of the total service cost enabled by Sentinel data. So this is, I think, an important message. The fact that you can make some economy of cost by using satellite data. Copernicus is about generating data and information. I have to say, in some way, we start to be somehow slave of our success because the amount of data generated by the program is huge. It's huge because the, the amount of data that are generated daily by the satellites and also by the services is enormous. There are many distribution hubs that are foreseen at this moment. They are foreseen for the, the distribution of the Sentinel data, of the contributing missions, access to images in near real time, accesses to archives, but also service information portals for added value products and indicators, models, archives, forecast products, and so on. So we have a huge number of points of access for all these data. The key links for this access, for the Sentinel data, so you see also from this slide what are the websites from which you can mostly access this data. So you have those uh, from uh, European Space Agency, so the scientific hub, and also the data access uh, from ESA. You see the website from which you have access to those data. The third block is about UMEDSAT, where you can have Copernicus online data access and also UMEDCAST. And on the bottom, you have the websites from which you can access the different products that are given by the services. So I invite you really to go there and to check what is available. Uh, for sure, all this will be improved in the future, but already you will have an idea of the number of data that can be available from the program. And what is very important is the green mention that are in some of these uh, blocks, what is called full, free and open. So the data, again, are full, you have access to everything, free, you don't have to pay for that, and open, so it's open to everyone. As I said in starting this issue about the data, we are somehow slave of the success. So we are in what we call the big data challenge. We are generating a huge amount of data. The slide mentioned massive amounts of data. And uh, on the bottom you see over 10 petabytes per year of new data with just Sentinel 1, 2 and 3 fully operational. It's a huge amount, so we need really the infrastructure to make this data available and the possibility to make the user capable to access this data. And so, in order to do that, we need different type of dissemination infrastructures. New technologies are needed because it's not something that can be done in traditional ways. ICT and Earth observation cross fertilization is very important. It's important also to interoperate with non Earth observation databases because some of the products are not just based on satellite data but need also other sources of information. There is also global Earth observation competition and is also very important in order to support the growth and job in the downstream sector. So after putting in place the Copernicus program as it is, the challenge we have today is really to improve the data distribution and the use of this data and to tackle the challenge of the big data. So when speaking about big data, we have a dual approach because we need strong Copernicus distribution services for downloads and for this we have an imminent launch of what we call data access and information services. These are using the acronym of DIAS. These platforms will help to access all Copernicus data and information co-located with computing resources, big data analytics without the need to download the data and information, and data fusion with non-Earth observation data and information. What would be the advantage? The advantage is that it would be possible to find all the data in one place to make the access to the, this data easy, not to download the data directly to your computer for processing them, for example, if you want to analyze some data series, but to compute directly the data on the platform in a way that you download simply the 
result that you need. This is the idea behind that. They are in the definition phase and they will be implemented in the months to come and we are sure that this will really improve dramatically the accessibility and the use of this data from the Copernicus program. As I said in the last part, overall ensuring that Copernicus data is easily accessible and used. It's very important not simply to distribute the data to say, hey guys, we have very good data, but that the data are used by the users. And there we have to promote the uptake of the Copernicus data and services. Three main parts, ensure the access, and for sure what I said before, so the platforms will help in order to ensure the access. Boost innovation, so we have to stimulate the use of this data to explain that through that it's possible to go in through new products, new capacities. The downstream sector has really a possibility there in order to boost this innovation. But in order to do that, so to ensure the access and to boost innovation, we have also to increase the awareness. So really to explain what we are doing and how it can be used. This is not simple because Copernicus program doesn't exist in any other country. I think it's very unique. When you speak about other programs, I take the example of uh, our, let's say, twin space program in the European Commission, Galileo, you want to explain it. You might say, is the European GPS, it's clear, it's more complicated than that, but the user would understand what is the objective of Galileo. Copernicus, if you follow all the presentation, you see that has many facets from the space part to the services, and really, it's more complicated sometimes to explain. And the range of users can go from expert to a simple user that in everyday life, it can be a farmer or it can be someone needing information for the transport and, and so on. So it's not very easy to understand. So the work in explaining what it is and what could be the benefit is extremely important. And in order to support the uptake of uh, the program, we have a full range of activities that has been foreseen. We had to reflect, but in the end we see that we had to create different tools that are adapted to different communities of users. So here you see a toolbox of different tools that can be used for that. So awareness materials, for example, promotional events, accelerator, uh, clusters, and, and so on. And then we need as well multipliers and networks so we have workshops, but we have also other activities that are mentioned there, so like uh, networks of Copernicus, uh, academy, and so on. And in order also to support the frequent questions that are raised, also Copernicus support office to which you can refer in order to get the first reply and to be addressed either to the right tool, to the right network, or directly to us in order to answer to some of the questions. This is very important and I think that, and we hope, that with this maybe will need to be improved in the future, but at least what has mentioned before, so increasing the awareness and increasing the use uh, is the target that will be achieved. So the conclusion, I hope that uh, with the presentation today, I explain you what is the Copernicus program. So I would like to repeat that it's been a long lasting adventure, starting in 98 and probably already at that moment, we didn't really understand and grasp what, would, would, what was the potential. And I think that even today that we are operation, probably we are not aware of all the potential of, of the program. And I think that those that could increase the potential are really the users, because they can really, by taking what we generate and creating new products, really invent new things, innovate. And this is what is very important for us. We did it, what was foreseen, but again, without help and the, and the users demonstrating and tell, uh, telling us how these data have been used, how, how they can be improved, I think that there will be no further improvement of the program. So we hope that with this one, with this uh, presentation, we give you the, uh, the wish, the will to do something, to use it. Please play with that. Do what you think can be useful. The areas that can be used, where it can be used, are very various. So you can see it's the state of the planet, monitoring the environment, security aspects, and so on. But you as user, you may have also new brilliant idea. So please use it 
and I hope that uh, you can really benefit of this that can be our effort in the last years and we hope that uh, uh, in the end you will be satisfied with what we have uh, been uh, developing in these years. In case you need more information, uh, our website is open for, uh, for, for access. We have videos on, uh, on uh, available in YouTube or other platforms where you can have also additional information. So I thank you very much for your attention and uh, I wish you all the best.